In this video, I'm gonna run through my basic search pattern and approach to a CT of the chest. So the first thing I do, I scroll all the way to the top of the image and I look at the inferior neck. The things that I like to take some time to look at, first and foremost are the thyroid gland, which you can see here. In addition to the thyroid gland, you can catch some of the internal carotid arteries. Here's the left and here's the internal carotid on the right. Uh, obviously you can look for calcified atherosclerosis leading to significant stenosis and you can follow those down to the aortic arch. You can also catch some enlarged lymph nodes sometimes in the inferior neck. I then start looking for lymph nodes. There's a few stations you have to pay attention to on the CT of the chest. The first place I look is the axilla. Here's the left axilla here and you can actually see some nodes. I'm circling one of them with my mouse there. Those are normal. It's normal to see nodes. It's just the ones that are enlarged, typically greater than a centimeter on the short axis. So I look on the other side, there's a lot of mediastinal nodes. A lot tend to hang out in front of the aorta. These are called prevascular nodes. There are nodes that hang out by the trachea, and here's one here, and then there's a subcarinal node. It's actually a subcarinal node right here. These are all normal sized lymph nodes, but nevertheless, you wanna look for enlarged nodes, pathologic looking nodes. Uh, beyond the mediastinum, another place to look for is the hilar region. The hyla is the medial aspect of the lung that has all the vessels, the branching bronchi, and you can see nodes there as well. And in this case, I don't see any pathologically enlarged lymph nodes. So the lymph nodes that I pointed out are all within normal limits. After looking at lymph nodes, I then change to the lung window and go straight to the lungs. The first thing I do is scroll all the way to the top. I focus in on the trachea, and I follow the trachea down until it branches into the main stem bronchi. It's a good example of a normal trachea. You can get some random diseases that affect the trachea, something called relapsing polychondritis. Really more of a test question than a real life thing to apply, but Certain diseases can affect the trachea beyond what I just said, relapsing polychondritis. There's amyloidosis, granulomatosis with polyangiitis. There's some systemic diseases you can think about if you see tracheal disease. After looking at the main stem bronchi, I then just look at the lungs. The things to pay attention to in the lungs, first is airspace disease. So you're looking for ground glass or consolidative opacities. In this case, this is normal lung parenchyma. If you see either ground glass or consolidative opacities, there's a lung differential. Most common things are pulmonary edema and pneumonia but there are all sorts of things you can think about. A lot of it depends on the patient, risk factors, history of autoimmune disease, history of cancer, whatever it may be. But pneumonia and pulmonary edema are gonna be your most common things. Pulmonary edema can also manifest as interlobular septal thickening, and you typically see these lines at the periphery of the lungs that are thickened. That can suggest an interstitial process, most commonly interstitial edema. In this case, these interlobular septae are normal. The alveoli are normal, there aren't any ground glass or consolidative opacities. And then of course you're looking for lung nodules. Certainly don't want to miss a lung mass, a primary lung cancer, metastatic disease to the lungs, which usually is the form of numerous different nodules. In this case, these are nice and normal lungs. And then pay attention to the pleura. So the two common things you see with pleural disease are one, pleural effusion. You've got all sorts of varieties of pleural effusions, transudative, exudative, and then there's the whole lymphatic obstruction thing that can lead to a chylothorax. In this case, there's no pleural effusion here. There's no fluid in the pleural space. The other big thing you always want to look for, especially in trauma, is a pneumothorax. Some of them are obvious. Some of them are not. If there's a really big one, you always want to check for mediastinal shift. In this case, there's no pneumothorax. Some of these can be pretty subtle. Thankfully, the subtle ones a lot of the times aren't going to end up mattering, but you don't want to miss it if you can. After I'm done looking at the lungs, I go back to the soft tissue window and pay attention to the cardiovascular system. So I look at the heart, pay attention to the chamber sizes. You have your left atrium here, left ventricle here, right ventricle here, and then you get a little bit of the right atrium there. Sometimes you can catch a thrombus in the left ventricular apex, a thrombus in the left atrial appendage, which is right here. A lot of that depends on contrast timing. I pay attention to the coronary arteries. A lot of patients have calcified coronary artery atherosclerosis, and sometimes clinicians want to know about that. Think about pericardial fluid or pericardial effusions. In this case, there's no fluid, but you look for that around the heart. Look at the aortic arch, make sure there's no aneurysm, dissection, that sort of thing. Make sure the branch vessels don't have high grade stenosis or occlusion. You have your brachiocephalic trunk, your left common carotid, and your left subclavian. I take a look at all those. Then take a look at the pulmonary artery. Here is the main pulmonary artery here. I pay attention to the caliber. If it's enlarged, it's actually pretty nonspecific, but pulmonary hypertension can manifest as an enlarged pulmonary artery. So I take note of the size of the pulmonary trunk. This one's normal. 
even though this is not timed appropriately for pulmonary emboli, I like to look at the pulmonary arteries and make sure there's, first and foremost, not a huge saddle embolus, but sometimes you can even evaluate more distally in the left and right branches, and I just want to make sure I don't see an obvious pulmonary embolus that you can potentially help the clinician by catching. That's about it with the cardiovascular system. I then go down to the upper abdomen. You'll always get a little bit of the upper abdomen, like the top of the liver here. You'll get a little bit of the spleen on the other side. There's some pancreas here in the center. You get a little bit of the stomach. Here's stomach. You get some bowel there. That's colon. And then here's some kidneys here. You're looking for masses, free air, whatever it may be. I have a video on how I approach the abdomen and pelvis. Obviously, you don't get all of that here. You get the top of the abdomen, but there are some important things to look at. After doing the upper abdomen, I then look at the chest wall. I start posteriorly and scroll up, and then I come back down looking anteriorly. Particularly in women, you want to look at the breasts and make sure there's no obvious breast mass where you maybe want to recommend a mammogram. And you're just looking for usually masses. You can see body wall edema sometimes. I mean, in this case, this all looks normal. I then look at the bones. I don't have the best window for bones here, but I like to go usually to the coronal and look at the ribs, make sure there's no rib fractures. I don't have the sagittal available to me here, but I like to look at the vertebra and the sagittal view. In this case, I'll just have to do it in the coronal, but you're looking for obvious compression fractures. You don't want to miss a met to a vertebral body. If the patient has a history of cancer, that's something you want to be on higher alert for. And I just take a look at all the bones. In the setting of trauma, the big thing is fracture, uh, but you also don't want to miss a bone mass or something else. And that is about it. That is my approach to the CT of the chest. Hopefully that helps you as you're just starting out. Obviously, as you see a lot of these studies, you'll develop your own search pattern. And what I have said and suggested may or may not apply based on what works best for you. But I hope that at least helps you starting off. And thanks so much for watching. See you next time.